Good morning, class. So today we're going to be going over Chapter 19, Endocrine and Hematologic Emergencies. Endocrine system influences nearly every cell, organ, and bodily function. Endocrine disorders can have many signs and symptoms. Hematologic emergencies are difficult to assess and treat. Their actions may save a life. Anatomy and physiology. Endocrine system is a communication system that controls functions inside the body. Endocrine glands secrete messenger messenger hormones. Endocrine disorders are caused by an internal communication problem. Glucose metabolism. The brain needs glucose and oxygen. Insulin is necessary for glucose to enter cells. The pancreas produces glucagon and insulin, stores and secretes insulin and glucagon in response to the blood glucose level. So pancreas is very important. So for those who don't have a pancreas they're going to be type 1 diabetics and anybody who's type 2 can control it with diet and exercise and also by taking their medications so diabetes mellitus impairs the body's ability to use glucose for fuel without treatment blood glucose levels become too high and severe cases may cause life-threatening illness or coma and death complications include blindness cardiovascular disease and kidney failure you need to know the signs and symptoms of blood glucose that is high hyperglycemia or low hypoglycemia. Hyperglycemia and hypoglycemia can occur with diabetes mellitus type 1 or type 2. All hypoglycemic patients require prompt treatment. Uh, type 1 diabetes, autoimmune disorder where the immune system produces antibodies against the pancreatic beta cells, missing the pancreatic hormone insulin. Onset usually happens from early childhood through the fourth decade of life. The patient must obtain insulin from an external source. So those people who have type 1 diabetes, they have type 1 diabetes when they're born. Type 2 diabetes develops over time due to poor diet, poor exercise. Many people with type 1 diabetes have an implanted insulin pump. Continuously measures glucose levels and provides an in adjustable infusion of insulin. Can malfunction and diabetic emergencies can develop. Always inquire about the presence of an insulin pump. Most common metabolic disease of childhood, new onset patient symptoms, polyuria, polydipsia, polyphagia, weight loss, fatigue. So excessive urination, excessive thirst, and excessive hunger are going to be your top three symptoms for anybody who is a diabetic or a new onset. <laughs> Patient's blood glucose level is above normal. Kidney's filtration system becomes overwhelmed and glucose spills into the urine. Glucose is unavailable to cells. Body turns to burning fat, produces acid waste, ketones. Kidneys cannot maintain acid base balance. Kuzmol respirations result. If fat metabolism and ketone production continue diabetic ketoacidosis, can develop or DKA may present as generalized illness. DKA can result in death, obtain patient's history and presentation, obtain a glucose level generally higher than 400 milligrams. Um, so when you take a patient's blood sugar, uh, depends on your monitor. Sometimes it'll just read high. Some monitors read anything above 400 is going to be high. Anything above 500 is going to be high. So it's important to know what kind of uh, monitor you guys have but generally anything above about 400 is going to read high on any monitor <laughs> so type 2 diabetes caused by resistance to the effects of insulin at the cellular level an association between obesity and increased resistance to the effects of insulin pancreas produces more insulin to make up for the increased levels of blood glucose and dysfunction of cellular insulin receptors Insulin resistance can sometimes be improved by exercise and dietary modification. Oral medications used to treat type 2 diabetes. Some increase secretion of insulin and pose a high risk of hypoglycemic reaction. Some stimulate receptors for insulin. Others decrease the effects of glucagon and decrease the release of glucose stored in the liver. Injectable medications and insulin are also used for type 2 diabetes. Often diagnosed at a yearly medical examination from complaints related to high blood glucose levels, including recurrent infection, change in vision, numbness in the feet. 
who have symptomatic hyperglycemia. Occurs when blood glucose levels are high. Patient is in a state of altered mental status resulting from several combined problems. And type 1 diabetes leads to ketoacidosis with dehydration from excessive urination. And type 2 diabetes leads to non-ketotic hypersmolar hyper state of dehydration. So for type 1 diabetes, when they have hyperglycemia, they're going to uh, have diabetic ketoacidosis. So they're going to be DKA. And type 2 diabetes is going to be, uh, I believe it's HNS. Uh, so only type 1 diabetes can have DKA, and only type 2 diabetes can have this uh, hypersmolar uh, state of dehydration. So HHNS is going to be uh, type 2. So hypersmolar hyperglycemic non-ketotic syndrome. When blood glucose levels are not controlled in diabetes, mellitus type 2, key signs and symptoms. High glu glucose levels in the blood cause the excretion of glucose in the urine. Patient increases fluid intake. Patient cannot drink enough fluid to keep up with the exceedingly high, glu high glucose levels in the blood. Urine becomes dark and concentrated. Patient may become unconscious or have seizure activity due to se severe dehydration. So symptomatic hypoglycemia, acute emergency where patient's blood glucose level drops and must be corrected swiftly, can occur in patients who inject insulin or use oral medications. When insulin levels remain high, glu glucose is rapidly taken out of the blood. If glu glucose levels fall, there may be an insufficient amount to supply the brain. Mental status declines. Patients may become aggressive or display unusual behavior. Unconsciousness or permanent brain damage can quickly follow. Hypoglycemia develops much more quickly than hyperglycemia. Signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia. So this is why it's important, especially with people who have low blood sugar. They need to get uh, sugar as quick as possible. Uh, the brain uses about 25% of the body's sugar. So hypoglycemia is quickly reversed by giving the patient glucose. So, so this is what the book says is normal. So 80 to 120 is going to be your normal range. Anything below 80 is going to be considered hypoglycemia. And anything below 40 is hypoglycemia, hypoglycemic crisis. And then hyperglycemia 120 to 400. And then once you get... It's about the 400 mark and get DKA or HHNS or symptomatic hyperglycemia where you're going to have Kuzmal respirations, patients breathing rapidly, irregularly, and also for at least DKA, you're going to have uh, what's called a fruity ketones or fruity breath. Uh, it smells like patients uh, chewing fruit, uh, fruit gum. So the scene size of patients with diabetes may use syringes to get their insulin in. Be alert for clues. Use standard precautions. Question bystanders on events leading to your arrival. Keep open the possibility that trauma may have occurred. So this is why it's good to do a full assessment on every patient, no matter what. Determine MOI, NOI. Primary assessment, form a general impression. Airway and breathing. Patient showing signs of inadequate breathing or pulse oximetry. Level less than or equal to 94% or altered mental status should receive high flow oxygen, 12 to 15 liters a minute, be a non breathing mask. <laughs> so hyperglycemic patients may have Kuzmal respiration and sweet fruity, fruity breath. So this is what I was saying. The fruity gum, it's going to smell like hypoglycemic patients will have normal or shallow to rapid respirations. Manage respiratory distress. So circulatory status, dry warm skin is hyperglycemia, moist pale skin is hypoglycemia, rapid weak pulse, symptomatic hypoglycemia. So some of these patients are going to be very diaphoretic, their, their shirt is going to be soaked in, in a sweat. So transport decision, transport promptly patients with altered mental status and impaired ability to swallow. So history taking, investigate chief complaint, obtain history of present illness from responsive patient, family, or bystanders. If patient has eaten but not taken insulin, hyperglycemia is more likely. 
if a patient has taken insulin but not eaten, hypoglycemia is more likely. So caref carefully observe signs and symptoms to determine whether hypo or hyperglycemic. So when patients have uh, diabetes and they do take insulin or they do take medications to help control their blood sugar, always ask if the patient's actually taking their insulin before or after eating because this might give you a good indication of what's going on. Sample history. Ask the patient, do you take insulin or pills to lower your blood sugar? Do you wear an insulin pump? Have you taken your usual insulin dose or pills today? Have you eaten normally today? Have you had any illness or unusual amount of activity or stress? So if the patients who are diabetics and they do have an unusual amount of activity, either excessive, their body's gonna burn a little bit more sugar and it's gonna cause them to crash a little bit. So secondary assessment, physical examination. Assess unresponsive patients from head to toe when you suspect a diabetes related problem. Focus on mental status, ability to swallow, ability to protect the airway. Obtain a GCS score. Vital signs, use a glucometer if available and protocols allow. Hypoglycemia, respirations are normal to rapid pulse, is weak and rapid and skin is typically pale and clammy with a low blood pressure. Hyperglycemia, respirations may be deep and rapid, pulse may be rapid, weak and thready, and skin may be warm and dry with a normal blood pressure. Portable glucometer, study the operator's manual for proper use in the field. Know the upper and lower ranges at which your glucometer functions. Normal fa non-fasting adult and child blood glucose level range, 80 to 120. Neonates should be above 70. So for Monterey County, anything below 70, we're gonna have to give sugar for. So reassessment, interventions, reassess patient with diabetes frequently for hypoglycemic, Conscious patients who can swallow. Encourage patients to take glucose tablets or drink juice containing sugar. So any soda, orange juice, apple juice, anything like that. Administer gel preparation or sugar drink if protocols allow. Provide rapid transport. So for those people who get sugar on scene and their sugar improves, you're gonna uh, you're gonna ask them if they want to go to the hospital. And they say no. You're gonna ask a family member to make a sandwich for them, get them some food, because that sugar that we give, that oral glucose, or if we give them sugar through an IV, they're gonna crash pretty quickly. So it's important to give them something that's not gonna make them crash too soon. So ask them to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich if you can. So hypoglycemic unconscious patient at risk of aspiration, patient needs intravenous or IV glucose or intramuscular. IV or intranasal, IN, glucagon, beyond EMT competencies. So, glucagon, glucagon is given IV for us in this county. When in doubt, consult medical control. If unable to test for blood glucose value, perform a thorough assessment. Contact the hospital to help sort out the signs and symptoms. Coordinate communication documentation. Patients who refuse transport after oral glucose may require more thorough documentation so emergency medical care for diabetic emergencies given oral glucose three types of oral glucose rapidly dissolving gel large chewable tablets liquid formulation so this is what we carry in our ambulance it gives about 24 grams of sugar and just ask the patient to pop off this cap and let them eat it and then what do you guys want to do after you guys give them an intervention or give them sugar? You want to reassess. Make sure that sugar comes up. Sometimes it barely comes up and you got to give them a second one. So oral glucose, contraindications, inability to swallow and unconsciousness. So patient does not have an open airway. Wear gloves before putting anything in patient's mouth. Follow local protocols for glucose. Administration, reassess frequently, provide transport. So when you guys give oral glucose and you take another blood sugar, the blood sugar is within normal limits, you guys transport to the hospital 
and it takes more than about 10 minutes or so. Or the patient goes ALOC again. You want to recheck his blood sugar. You want to give him another, another round of glucose. I've had it happen a few times where I've given IV glucose and I've had to recheck patient's blood sugar after the second time and blood glucose level has uh, dipped down to below normal limits and I had to give him another round of glucose. So this is why we reassess for every patient. So a presentation of hypoglycemia. Seizures should be considered very serious. Hypoglycemia is a possible cause of seizures, may indicate a potentially life-threatening underlying condition management. So alter mental status or ALOC may be caused by other condition, may be caused by diabetes complications, use the mnemonic AEIOU tips. So for any altered patient, we'll go over this a little later, AEIOU tips is going to tell you, tell you what to look for, possibilities of why patients unconscious or altered. So management. Misdiagnosis of neurologic dysfunction. Symptoms may mistaken for intoxication. Patient with diabetes confined by police is at risk. Look for emergency medical identification. Perform blood glucose tests at scene if protocols allow. Diabetes and alcoholism can coexist in a patient. Relationship to airway management. May not have a gag reflex. Vomit or tongue may obstruct airway. Carefully monitor airway, place patient lateral recumbent position, make sure suction is available. Hematologic emergencies. Hematology is the study of blood related diseases, three disorders that can create a pre hospital emergency sickle cell disease, hemophilia A, and thrombophilia. So blood is made up of four components. Red blood cells contain hemoglobin, which carries oxygen to the tissues. White blood cells respond to infection and collect dead cells for their correct disposal. Platelets assist in clot formation. Plasma serves as a transportation medium. So sickle cell disease, inherited disease affects red blood cells. Predominantly in Sorry, class. So predominantly in people of African, Caribbean, and South American ancestry, people with sickle cell disease may have mishap in RBCs or red blood cells that lead to dysfunction in oxygen binding and unintentional clot formation. Clots may result in a blockage known as vasoocclusive crisis and result in hypoxia, pain, and organ damage. Sickled cells have a short lifespan, results in more cellular waste products and contributing to sludging of the blood. Complications include anemia, gallstones, jaundice, splenic dysfunction, and vascular occlusion with ischemia. ischemia. Sickle cell disease. Many of these complications are very painful and potentially life-threatening. So your normal blood cells are going to be looking like this. So right here, they, they're circle. So sickle cells are going to look like um, like a crescent, like uh, the moon. So this is why these these things uh, have a vasoocclusive crisis. They get stuck in the vessels, and they prevent blood flow from going to the vessels. And this is why it causes a lot of pain and not enough blood get to the to the other parts of the body. <laughs> So it's a life-threatening uh, illness if they have a splenic crisis. <laughs> so clotting disorders. Hemophilia, rare. Only about 20,000 Americans have the disorder. Hemophilia A affects mostly males. Decreased ability to create a clot after an injury, which can be life-threatening. Patients typically have intravenous factor uh, 8 replacement infusions, which help the blood clot close at hand. Clotting disorders, thrombophilia, disorder in the patient's and the body's ability to maintain the smooth flow of blood through the venous and arterial systems, concentration of particular elements in the blood, creates clogging or blockage issues, general term for many conditions that result in blood clotting more easily than normal. Clots can spontaneously develop in the blood of the patient. Clotting disorders, deep vein thrombosis or DVTs. Common medical problem in sedentary patients and patients who have recent 
injury or surgery. Methods designed to prevent blood clot formation include blood thinning medications, um, compression stockings, mechanical devices. So for people who have DVT, uh, they're at risk of getting a clot. They're usually going to be on some sort of blood thinners, uh, Coumadin, Warfarin, Eliquis, things like that. So, and also when it says sedentary patients, so patients who are in SNFs and are bed bound, they're usually going to have some compression stockings in their legs to make sure that they get improved blood flow down there. And also patients, we've talked about this before, patients who are on long airplane flights, who are sitting down for a long time, their blood could pull on their legs, and then once they get up, a clock could bust loose. So also ask if a patient's had a recent surgery, if all of a sudden they start complaining of shortness of breath and uh, some pinpoint chest pain it might be a PE or pulmonary embolism mm -hmm. so clotting disorders DVT risk factors treatment anticoagulation therapy oral medication typically administered for at least three months after diagnosis of a DVT a clot from the DVT can travel from the patient's lower extremity to the lung causing a pulmonary embolism or a PE So seen size up, seen safety, most sickle cell patients will have had a crisis before. Wear gloves and eye protection at a minimum. Consider ALS support, MOI, NOI. Remember trauma may also have occurred. So primary assessment, perform cervical spine immobilization if necessary. Form a general impression. Is a patient tracking you? Is a patient alert? Is a patient unconscious when you're walking in? Airway and breathing, inadequate breathing or ultra mental status, high flow oxygen at 12 to 15 liters a minute via non-rebreathing mask. Sickle cell crisis patients may have increased respirations or signs of pneumonia. Circulation, sickle cell patients, increased heart rate, hemophilia, be alert for signs of acute blood loss. Note bleeding of unknown origin, be alert for signs of hypoxia, make a transport decision. Transport to an ED is recommended for any patient with sickle cell crisis or hemophilia. History taking. Investigate chief complaint. Obtain history of present illness from responsive patients, family, or bystanders. Be alert for physical signs indicating sickle cell crisis. Ask about is pain isolated in a single location or felt throughout body, visual disturbances, Nausea, vomiting, or abdominal cramping, chest pain, or shortness of breath. Obtain sample history from responsive patient or family member. Have you had a crisis before? When was the last time you had a crisis? How did your last crisis resolve? Recent illness, unusual amounts of activity or stress. So for anybody who has sickle cell anemia, they're probably gonna be diagnosed with it by a doctor. They're also, they also might have a piece of paper. I ran on somebody while I was in my internship getting my paramedic license where they had a whole a list of things going on and list of things for the uh, EMS crew to do for the patient when they were having a sickle cell crisis. Which hospital to take them to, what medications to give them. So secondary assessment, physical examination, focus on major joints, evaluate and document mental status using AVPU, vital signs, obtain complete set of vital signs, look for signs of sickle cell crisis, use pulse oximeter if available. Reassessment, reassess vital signs frequently. Remember, stable about 15 minutes, every 15 minutes, unstable is every five. Evaluate interventions and adjust or change as necessary. This is why we do reassessments. We're going to need to adjust some things. Patient improves or patient deteriorates or change some things when needed. Administer supplemental oxygen via non-rebreathing mask at 12 to 15 liters a minute. Communicate with hospital staff for continuative care and document clearly. So emergency medical care for hematologic disorders. Mainly supportive and symptomatic. Patients with inadequate breathing or altered mental status administer high flow oxygen at 12 to 15 liters a minute via non rebreathing mask. Place in position of comfort, transport rapidly to the hospital. So, review 
type 1 diabetes is a condition in which Remember, it's pancreas. That's important for your, your sugar levels. If you have a pancreas, you're probably going to have type 2 diabetes if you have diabetes. So B, type 1 diabetes is a disease in which the pancreas fails to produce enough insulin or produces none at all. Insulin is a hormone that promotes the uptake of sugar from the bloodstream and into the cells. Without insulin, glucose utilization is impaired because it cannot enter the cell. So a 45-year-old man with type 1 diabetes is found unresponsive, which the following question is most important to ask his wife. So remember type 1 diabetes, probably going to be diagnosed at birth or soon after. So not really worried about how long he's been a diabetic. Not really worried about when he's seen his physician or what kind of insulin he takes. Yeah, it's important to know, but it's not critical. So A, all these questions are important to ask the spouse of an unconscious diabetic. However, it is critical to ask if the patient took his insulin. This will help you differentiate hypoglycemic crisis from hyperglycemic crisis. For example, the patient took his insulin, did not eat, or actually took too much insulin. You should suspect hypoglycemic crisis. If the patient did not take his insulin. You should suspect hyperglycemic crisis. So a diabetic patient presents with the blood glucose level of 310 and severe dehydration. The patient's dehydration is a result of <laughs> so A, in severe hyperglycemia, the kidneys sec secrete excess glucose from the body this process requires a large amount of water to accomplish therefore water is excreted with the glucose resulting in dehydration so remember water osmosis sugar follows water so for diabetic patients who pee a lot uh, the sugar is going to go out of their body So which combination of factors would most likely cause a hypoglycemic crisis in a diabetic patient? So remember, insulin and glucose or sugar is kind of the teeter-tottering effect. People take insulin because their sugar is too high, so they want to bring it down. So if they take insulin or take too much insulin, it's going to crash their blood sugar down. They take insulin and skip a meal, they're not getting that fuel or they're not getting that sugar. So insulin is going to drop them way down. So B, combination that will most likely cause a hypoglycemic crisis is skipping a meal and taking insulin. The patient will use up all available glucose in the bloodstream and become hypoglycemic. Left untreated hypoglycemic crisis may cause uh, per permanent brain damage or even death. So a 19-year-old diabetic male was found unresponsive on the couch by his roommate. After confirming the patient is unresponsive, you should remember, follow your assessments, follow your medical, your trauma, 
What comes first in your primary assessment? What have you already figured out? Your general imp impression. Patient's found on the couch. He looks unresponsive. So what's going to be next in your, in your assessment, your primary assessment? ABCs. Make sure his airway is open. So B, after immediately determining that the patient is unresponsive, your first action should be able to manually open his or her airway, head tilt, chin lift, or jaw thrust. Use suction as needed to clear secretions from the patient's mouth. After manually opening the airway and ensuring it is clear of obstructions, insert a nasal airway adjunct and then assess the patient's breathing. So what breathing pattern would you most likely encounter in a patient with diabetic ketoacidosis, DKA? So in patients with DKA, they're gonna be alert. They're gonna have rapid respirations. So C, or Kuzmal respiration. So rapid and deep breathing pattern seen in patients with DKA indicates that the body is attempting to eliminate the ketones via the respiratory system. A fruity or acetone breath odor is usually present in patients with Kuzmal respirations. So a woman called EMS because her 12-year-old son, who had been experiencing excessive urination, thirst, and hunger for the past 36 hours, has an altered mental status and is breathing fast. You should be most suspicious for... So remember, we just went over this. What is DKA? Is it a condition associated with hypoglycemic? hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia so d the child experiencing a hyperglycemic crisis secondary severe hyperglycemia hyperglycemic crisis is characterized by a slow onset and excessive urination polyuria thirst polydipsia and hunger polyphagia other signs include rapid, deep breathing with a fruity or acetone breath odor, Kuzmal respirations, a rapid, thready pulse, and an altered mental status. <laughs> if the cells do not receive glucose, they will begin to metabolize. So A, if the body cells do not receive glucose, they will begin to metabolize the next most readily Available substance, fat. Fat metabolism results in production of keto acids, which are released into the bloodstream, hence the term ketoacidosis. In contrast to hyperglycemic crisis, a hypoglycemic crisis. So most of the time, well, you're not going to give sugar to a patient who's already hyperglycemic. Hypoglycemic patients, are it's usually pretty quick. They go unconscious pretty quickly. They're not going to develop over a period of hours or days. They're, they usually pop out of uh, their ALOC or unresponsiveness after you give them sugar. So D... Hypoglycemic crisis usually responds immediately following treatment with glucose. Patients with hyperglycemic crisis generally respond to treatment gradually within 6 to 12 hours following the appropriate treatment. Seizures can occur with both hyperglycemic crisis and hypoglycemic crisis, but are more common in patients with hypoglycemic crisis. Patients with diabetic ketoacidosis experience polydipsia because... So A, severe hyperglycemia, which leads to diabetic ketoacidosis, or DKA, causes the body to excrete large amounts of glucose and water. As a result, the patient becomes severely dehydrated, which leads to excessive thirst or polydipsia. 
Remember, water osmosis, sugar follows water. So patients who do pee a lot, uh, their sugar is going to, they're going to lose a lot of sugar too. When dealing with hematologic disorders, the EMT must be familiar with the composition of blood, which the following is considered a hematologic disease. Remember, there's three of them that we talked about already. So D, hematology is a study in prevention of blood-related diseases, such as sickle cell disease and hemophilia. What are the two main components of blood? So B, the blood is made up of two main components, cells and plasma. The cells in the blood include red blood cells or erythrocytes, white blood cells, leukocytes, and platelets. These cells are suspended in a straw-colored flavor called plasma. So excuse me, erythrocytes and hemoglobin. Erythrocytes are a type of blood cell and hemoglobin is chemical that is contained within the blood cells. Cells and plasma, leukocytes and white blood cells. Leukocytes are white blood cells, which are a type of blood cell. And platelets are a type of blood cell. And neutrophils are a type of white blood cell. The assessment of a patient with a hematologic disorder is the same as it is with all other patients that an EMT will encounter. In addition to obtaining a sample history, EMT should ask which of the following questions. <laughs> These are all good questions to ask. Because usually a patient can help, help the EMTs out, tell them what they normally um, interventions they get will make the call go a lot smoother. So D, sample is a mnemonic used in taking a history of all patients. In addition to asking the sample, EMT should also ask about past crises. <laughs> Which of the following is not an appropriate treatment for EMTs to provide to a patient who has a hematologic disorder? So A, although analgesics would benefit a patient suffering from a hematologic disorder, the administration of such medications is not in the scope of practice for the EMT. ALS providers would have to be present to provide this emergency care. So basically any pain medications, so morphine, fentanyl, ketamine, anything like that is an analgesic.